Now on BBC Radio 4, Doctor Who writer Mark Gatiss explores those novelizations that are, like all good books, bigger on the inside than on the outside. On the outside, it looked, as ever, like an old-fashioned police box. But its appearance was deceptive. For the TARDIS was a highly advanced time and space ship. Though small on the outside, its interior was huge, at least 20 times bigger inside than outside. One of the doors flung open, and a pretty young woman stepped out. I'm never going in that thing again. The doctor emerged. Now then, Joe, be reasonable. He smiled to show that being lost in space and time was all part of a day's work. Even without the keys to a TARDIS, it's possible to transport some of us back to a magical childhood time when all nights seemed wintry and dark, the football results never ended, and Doctor Who was the best show on television. Happily, Doctor Who is once again the best thing on television, but let's for a moment wallow in the ice canoes of nostalgia. It's hard to explain what the show meant to us back then in the 70s. It was the great constant in our little lives. The heroic Doctor, the fantastic monsters, the gently moralising stories. And during the eternity between new seasons, we had the books. Target books, as the imprint was called. They gave us exciting versions of the stories we'd seen on television and glimpses into the show's strange and mysterious past where the Doctor had been someone else. Whenever I was off school, my medicine of preference was always a well-read copy of Doctor Who and the Planet of the Daleks, and maybe Oxtail Soup, because it took me light years away from my four walls in County Durham and into the Doctor's universe. What a comfort and genuine inspiration those Target books were. And they were phenomenally successful. They changed the reading habits of a generation. Not very far away, there stood a shape even more incongruous than the dome. It was a police box. Of a kind once used They've even changed their appearance and found a new lease of life as audiobooks. The interior of the box made nonsense of its outward appearance. Its interior space was unlimited and styled with an elegant futurism. A tall man was staring intently into the console's glowing central column. An extraordinary long scarf trailed around his neck. His usually cheerful features were set in a frown of brooding intensity. The whole concept of Doctor Who is simply genius. One brilliant idea after another. An anti-hero who can change his appearance, a spaceship that doesn't look like a spaceship, that's also a time machine that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. It's ours, too, a gloriously British idea that's now been with us, on and off, for 46 years. When the first proper series of Doctor Who books were launched in 1973, the series was in excellent shape. It had been running for a decade, with three actors having played the lead role. William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton were the first two, and in 1970 the series moved to colour, with a new Doctor, John Pertwee, who was an immediate success. His warm, action-loving, moral, vain, frilly-shirted dandy was my Doctor, and I loved him. When I meet a regime that needs to import savage alien life forms as security guards, I begin to wonder who the real criminals are. What you're saying is that the entire human population of this planet, apart from a few remarkable exceptions like yourself, are really only fit to lead the life of a dog. People have never been happier or more prosperous. Then why do you need so many people to keep them under control? Don't they like being happy and prosperous? Who really rules this planet of yours? There had been three standalone Doctor Who novelizations of TV stories published in the 60s, featuring William Hartnell. Aware of the show's new lease of life under John Pertwee, a small children's publisher, Target Books, decided to reprint these earlier novelizations with new cover illustrations. They did well. And so the people at Target thought, like the villainous Omega before them, it is not enough. Well, the beginning of the Doctor Who range goes back to a guy called Richard Henwood being asked to start a new line of children's books, which were Target books. Terence Dix was script editor on the series and writer-in-chief of Target books. So he came to the BBC, got a licence to novelise Doctor Who, then got shunted onto the Doctor Who office and said, you know, I must have more Doctor Who books. I need them urgently. Who is going to write them? And I said, I will. 
and I did the first one, which is Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion. That was the first one ever in 74. That sold well, and um, the whole thing kind of dropped into my hand. Little could Target have guessed how hungry the Doctor Who audience would turn out to be for these stories. The novelizations would become one of the best-selling ranges of children's books ever published. When the books first came out, schools and teachers were fairly sniffy about them because they said, they're not proper books, you know, they're linked to a television yeah. programme, for God's sake. And then they found that kids who would not pick up a book to save their lives would grab a Doctor Who book. Yeah. Russell T. Davis is showrunner and lead writer on the new series. They were a big part of my childhood and, and way beyond my childhood, I have to say, the arrival of Target books. I can remember when they didn't exist. So the history of Doctor Who was a great mystery to a lot of people and a fantastic mystery if you were a child. You know, your mum and dad would talk about these old black and white adventures, stories that you couldn't remember, which then suddenly, out of the blue, started arriving on the bookshelves. The three old paperbacks from the 60s were republished, which then became a line of novelising slowly over many years every single Doctor Who televised adventure ever. They are documenting a Doctor Who story and you couldn't just watch that story if you wanted to. David J. Howe is a Doctor Who authority. We're talking here the 70s and there were no videos, no DVDs. There was no way you could watch a Doctor Who story again. You just couldn't. They were very rarely repeated on the BBC and so the only way you could relive these adventures was to pick up the book and relive the adventures. As a boy with a young, well, young face, I devoured these books. Not literally, though I did live in the North and I was always hungry. I remember going into a shop in 1975 and seeing the novelisation of the series' 10th anniversary story, The Three Doctors, which had been on TV a couple of years before. The cover illustration showed the power-crazed Omega crackling cosmic energy over all three incarnations of the Doctor, and I just had to have it. I bought it for 35p, and while my parents went shopping at a garden centre in Darlington, I sat in the back seat of the Hillman Minx and read it straight through. My first Target book. I read it, I reread it, I think I knew every word. My second was Doctor Who and the Cybermen. Annoyingly, the last 20 pages were missing due to a binding mistake at the publishers. My copy ended with Jamie, the doctor's assistant, saying, I don't understand. How could that happen, doctor? I thought, that's an oblique ending. Or possibly I didn't. I didn't get a proper version for years. Although loyal to the John Pertwee stories, I became obsessed with stories of previous incarnations of the doctor, of which I was too young to have first-hand knowledge. It became a wonderful ritual, saving pocket money, then deciding which target book I would go for. They'd come out monthly, and I remember, honestly, powerfully, it's a really powerful thing, the Saturday journey into town to try and find in a bookshop the new book. There was no Amazon, there was nothing like that. You wouldn't absolutely know the date when a new book was coming out, and you wouldn't know which one it was. And it was really exciting. I can remember the day two came out in one month. They bought, for some strange reason, I think it was like either The Auton Invasion and The Abominable Snowman, and there were two new novels on sale in W. H. Smith, and literally that was a red letter day. That was so exciting. And I remember that's when I met my very first fellow Doctor Who fan, because there was a girl there buying those books at the same time. We both snatched them off the shelf. The Target books were written by a pool of writers, most of whom had worked on the programme. Then script editor Terence Dix took the lion's share, but there were others too. Philip Hinchcliffe, Malcolm Hulk, Jerry Davis, Brian Hales, Ian Martyr. Part of the joy of reading the books was the house style. The multitude of chapters headed Escape to Danger or The Enemy Within or An End and a Beginning or the classic description of the TARDIS appearing with a wheezing groaning sound. A wheezing groaning sound filled the laboratory. A wheezing groaning sound filled the night air of calm. Emerging. Strange wheezing and groaning filled the air. Sounds a wheezing groaning room. sound shattered the peace and stillness of the mountain air. On the outside, we would be told... It looked like an old-fashioned police box. But on the inside... Inside the police box was an ultra-modern control room with a centre console of complex instruments. It was a vast ultra-modern control room dominated by a many-sided centre console of complex instruments. Oddly, one of the things that people love about the targets over the years are your house-style descriptions. Did that come about because... You know, you really, you had to have a sort of house style that meant it was possible to get through the workload, or was it also part of of shaping your version of events, as it were? I think it was sheer perversity, really. <laughs> I mean, uh, and laziness. 
Terence Dix. If I got what sounded a good description for yeah. the TARDIS taking off, a wheezing, groaning sound, why not keep it, yeah. you know? Why yeah. rack your brains to find, you know, a hissing, snarling sound <laughs> or something like that? Wheezing, groaning, perfectly good. It's funny, know. isn't it? Because t- time is very... Is, is very it's like a sort of blessing in so many ways. What people might have been grumpy about then becomes they what they love treasure. about it. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It. it gets a traditional, yes. uh, a traditional yes. feel about it, yeah. There were wonderful stock descriptions of the Doctor himself. William Hartnell was usually in the crotchety old man in a frock coat with long flowing white hair area, whilst Patrick Troughton had baggy check trousers and a mop of untidy black hair with a faraway look in his eyes which were either green-blue or blue-green and which were funny and sad at the same time. My doctor, John Pertwee, had an old young face and a beak of a nose and a mane of prematurely white hair, while Doctor Number 4, the great Tom Baker, routinely had a mop of curly hair, a broad-brimmed hat and a long multicoloured scarf which contributed to a casual bohemian elegance. His successor, Peter Davison, was a slight fair-haired figure with a pleasant open face. Jaws made me try and imagine what an unpleasant closed face looked like. The monsters, too, had their own familiar style. Inside the armour casing of a Dalek was a bubbling ball of hate. Meanwhile, the Cybermen were routinely described as tall, emotionless silver giants motivated by one goal. Power. The girl, she will betray us. The hissing green ice warriors were always described as a once proud race. I love that. I still long to create a race of aliens that were once proud and are now not. There were so many other great recurring lines. It was a graveyard in space. Like elementary, my dear Watson, it probably didn't occur at all. It just feels like an archetypal target book opening. The books were beautifully designed, made to be collected, and artist Chris Achilios was the great cover illustrator. He had this fantastic technique of doing the main picture of the Doctor as a series of tiny black and white dots, almost pointillist, which I loved. The colours were always dazzling, like a film poster, using a montage of swirling stars and planets, with the Doctor and his companions foregrounded, and always the small target insignia on the spine. Chris Achilios. Well, it's a graphic style. It's not a painting as such. It's a composition, very carefully thought out and designed, drawn, first of all, with a repeatograph dot technique, and then coloured in. The changing face of Doctor Who. The cover illustration portrays the third Doctor Who, whose physical appearance was altered by the Time Lords when they banished him to the planet Earth in the 20th century. John Pertwee was still on TV. He was the current doctor then. And I did more of him at that time than anything else. He was really sensitive about his nose, so I received a letter from the BBC telling me that if I could uh, (laughs) compromise a bit with his likeness, uh, i.e. paint his nose a little smaller, and I really thought he was someone in the office playing a joke on me, but John Pedwee asked the publishers to ask me to paint him with a smaller nose. But I didn't see a problem in it at all. I don't think his nose is too big. His eyes flickered open. Tears, Sarah Jane? Remember, while there's life, there's... <gasps> Brigadier, look! said Sarah. It's starting! A golden glow was appearing round the doctor's body. Even as they watched... The features began to blur and change. Well, bless my soul, said the brigadier. Here we go again. Elizabeth Sladen, who played the Doctor's assistant, Sarah Jane Smith, reading from Doctor Who and the Planet of the Spiders, novelised by Terence Dix. Adaptations of books into television are a staple of TV. But what about the other way around? Novelisation of telly into books is regarded as a rather lowly form but it has its own art, its own alchemy. So, were the target writers guided by the episodic structure of the TV series? Did they write mini cliffhangers within chapters? Did they expand the original story, or did they keep it tight and cut the padding? David J. Howe. During the period that the target books were being published, Doctor Who was on television as a weekly episodic series. So every week you would have an adventure, and you would end with a cliffhanger. 
And the idea of the cliffhangers was very central to Doctor Who's concept. There were very few other television series which had a cliffhanger every week that kind of kept you watching. And this made the books, of course, very exciting to read because every few chapters you would have a massive cliffhanger which made you want to read on. The laboratory was flooded with glaring light and Sarah found herself leaning over not the doctor but a monstrosity so horrible she clapped her hand over her mouth to stifle a scream. Did you feel, in terms of the production's broadcast scripts, that you wanted to maintain them as closely as possible to the, the broadcast ones or was it a, a wonderful chance to elaborate you know, because the special effects budget in your head is obviously greater than on the screen. Mm, mm. It, it's both, really. In the beginning, when I was writing far fewer, I would expand things that were in the original script, yeah. you know, or invent incidents that were fecal to another incident or mm -hmm. something. So there'd be stuff in them that wasn't in the scripts. But gradually, as the pressure increased, and I say it, it did get down to one a month, you yeah. know, I decided that the purpose of the book was to reproduce the show in the reader's head. See, because in those days you didn't get any repeats. Yeah. So if you missed the show, you missed it. You were not going to get a chance to see it again. Mm. And I think I heard in Australia that um, the books arrived before the show, somebody <laughs> told me. And that people read the books, which did quite well, and then they suddenly realised, oh, there's a television show attached. I rather like to think they thought they were filming the books or something. Yeah. <laughs> the, like the, Austin. the other way around. Yeah, yeah absolutely, <laughs> the, other, the other way around. But um, basically that became the operation to, you know, so that as you read the book, it was as if you were watching the show. An inner door opened and a slender, dark-haired girl came into the control room. She wore an attractive... Old-fashioned dress. Look what I found, Doctor. Look what I found! The Doctor glanced at her absent-mindedly. Hello, Victoria. What? The girl, whose name was Sarah Jane Smith, looked at him indignantly. Where did you get that dress? I just told you, I found it back there in the wardrobe. I found it in the wardrobe. Why? Oh, Don't you like it? Do you like it? The Doctor nodded vaguely. Yes. Oh, yes, I always, I always did. did. Victoria. It belonged to Victoria. She travelled with me for a time. Tom Baker, reading from Doctor Who and the Pyramids of Mars, novelised by Terence Dix. The TARDIS isn't out of control or anything, is oh, it? No, 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 it was just a, a, a bumpy landing. Super! They all rush towards well, the door like excited on. children. Only half an hour. We'll go out for half an hour. Right. But you're not going out like that! The Doctor's voice stopped them. You need spacesuits, there's no atmosphere out there. Come on, there's some in the chest. You'll find spacesuits in the equipment room. Jamie's eyes were still fixed on the bright landscape shown on the screen. We'll maybe meet the old man. Do you man think we'll moon? meet the old man in the moon? Ben turned back to Jamie. You won't meet a dicky bird, mate, if you don't follow me and get some well, gear on. Nobody, mate, if you don't get some gear on. Uh, what? Why? Oh, Annika Wills, who played the doctor's assistant Polly, reading from Doctor Who and the Cybermen, novelised by Jerry Davis. The way I actually adapted the scripts was pretty straightforward. You have the final shooting script, you have all the dialogue there, and you fill in the descriptive bits, you know, putting it bluntly. Philip Hinchcliffe was producer of the series and wrote a number of Target books. When I thought of doing one of the adaptations, it was decided Seas of Doom, I think, was a good one to do. With a good script, you're helped with some good lines of dialogue and hopefully characterful lines of dialogue. Um, it was understandable why Dunbar adopted a sceptical, even sarcastic attitude to the peculiar personage who invaded his office later that afternoon. I doubt very much if you can help us, uh, Doctor, he began frostily. These pictures have baffled all the experts. The only reasonable explanation seems to be that the pod comes from some extinct species of plant. The Doctor sprawled into a chair, dumped his feet on Dunbar's desk and beamed a large, friendly smile. It is a sign of a tiny mind to look for reasonable explanations, Mr. Dunbar. The universe is full of unreasonable things, only capable of being explained unreasonably. It's impossible to divorce the target books from the period. There was no video, no record. Scarcely anything was repeated except last Christmas's Mike Yarwood show. So if you missed something, you missed it. We treasured every clip of Doctor Who that was broadcast. Many of the black and white 1960s stories had been wiped by the BBC altogether, so the novelizations were the only record. Through them, you could experience stories that had disappeared into the programme's folklore. 
Annika Wills. The BBC were happily chucking away these tapes. I mean, on another level. OK, you have to wonder if there was anybody intelligent in charge, you know. Of course, tapes were very expensive in those days, so what they did was they overplayed them. They played something else over them. But at the same time, we are also talking about trashing Patrick Troughton's work, which is just astounding. So you see how, then, important the Target books are, because this is the only record that we have. The doctor came to a sudden halt. Jamie, look! A little way ahead, just off the main path, stood the still forms of three yeti. They're not moving, whispered the doctor. Maybe they're switched off. If I could just examine... Jamie tugged at his arm. Aye, and what if someone switches them on while you're doing it? Come on, let's get to the TARDIS while we still can. The doctor sighed. I suppose you're right. David Troughton, reading from Doctor Who and the Abominable Snowmen, novelised from a story that's been lost forever. Faithful to the show they certainly were, but there were things the books, being books, could do better. After all, a typewriter can take you anywhere in the universe, not just to a home county's quarry. Alien races were fleshed out, doomed minor characters were brought out and developed. Some books stayed close to the dialogue with minimal description and were rather thin. Others were just that little bit more literary. The writers at the time tried to make the story as close to the television as possible. I think they achieved that, but they also, whether they knew it or not, achieved a deeper understanding. Caroline John played the third Doctor's assistant, Liz Shaw. What the books do is fill out a lot of gaps, especially of the lesser characters, so that you come to realise who they are more deeply why they're thinking in the way they are. They're given more time. And also with a book, you can delve more deeply into the reasons why, especially the Silurians, because they all have names now. They all become entities in their own right. You get a better depth and probably improve when you go back to watch the actual television story. You've got more insight into the characters and what's going on. Jo thought she heard something moving on the floor. She looked behind her armchair at the open door. There was nothing. She went back to her book. The maggot came quietly round the open door. It looked across the floor to the armchair. The sight of so much delicious food was irresistible. It arched its back and started to wriggle silently across the floor. Katie Manning, who played the third Doctor's assistant, Joe Grant, reading from Doctor Who and the Green Death, novelised by Malcolm Hulk. Writing of that style, as we just had read out to us there, I think is a work of genius. Malcolm Hulk, the writer of that novel of the Green Death, of all the people who wrote Target books, absolutely understood how to do a proper novelisation. Gary Russell is a script editor on the new series. There was a bit there where you were seeing the story, not just from Joe Grant's point of view as she was reading a book, but from the maggot's point of view. And if you go through some of the very best of the target novelizations, whether they're Malcolm Hulk's, whether they're Terence Dix's, whether they're Barry Letts's, there is this amazing ability to see every person's point of view, to understand. So there's no black and white heroes and villains and monsters and good guys there's a point of view to every single creature, every single human being, every single alien. And that's the joy of the Target books. Their their absolute delight is their ability to make you see everybody's point of view. And a good novelisation of a TV show should do that all the time. I've written for the character of the Doctor myself, and as a writer, one of the cardinal rules is you don't go inside the Doctor's head. One of my favourite things about the character, the idea of the Doctor, is that although he looks like us, sounds like us, and wants to be like us, he isn't like us. I think that at heart, he's a lord, a time lord, and even at his most blokey, like Christopher Eccleston, or his most human, like David Tennant or Peter Davison, there's something of the Tennant farmer about him. No pun intended. He comes down to the fields and mucks in, but he doesn't really belong there. Or he's like a great village GP who helps people with their problems, but in essence belongs to the big house on the hill. I think that's rather wonderful. It doesn't make him posh, it makes him other. 
There's a who in the title, after all. Russell T. Davis. You'll find in the old books that it's very hard to get inside his head, and actually they don't. What I mean is they don't present events from the doctor's point of view. In other words, what he's thinking. You don't go through his thought processes. It's that, you know, some people sort of say, well, it makes the doctor a bit boring in print. I think the opposite, actually, because he remains slightly unknowable. Actually, if you're going to start dipping into his mind, saying the doctor thought this, the doctor thought that, actually he's thinking of 57 things at once. He's thinking of a thousand things you know nothing about that wouldn't even make sense to humans. And actually, once you get inside his head, you tend to find he could solve the plot within five minutes. A lot of Doctor Who writing is actually delaying getting the Doctor to the ending because he's so clever. And not just scientifically clever, he's literally clever. He's, he's, his insights into human nature are clever. You know, you're dealing with a genius. And I think what sustains the Doctor over what is, what is it now, 46 years, is that still, to this day, you never actually really know what he's thinking, which means he could be thinking anything and do anything, and that keeps him alive. In 2005, Doctor Who returned to our screens. And of course, you can now get the DVD of the show you watched almost immediately. And just a few months later, you get the bells and whistles version with extras and special features. And yes, you can take DVDs with you on holiday. But there are no novelizations of the new Doctors and their wonderful adventures. Which is a terrible shame, because somewhere, there will always be some child in the back of some car on some windswept pier or whose parents are spending hours trundling round some garden centre, who, if only they had their little copy of The Empty Child, or Tooth and Claw, or Rise of the Cybermen, or The Satan Pit, or The Family of Blood, with a lovely cover and a beautifully realised novelisation, would be as happy as, well, as I was. Yeah, Planet of the Dance, of the yeah, yeah. I, my, this is my favourite. I always return to it, and it's, it has such a special place in my heart. Um, I really, do, honestly, it's 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 not it's not an exaggeration to say that for so many people, it it was their introduction to literature. Uh, it opened doors not only into Doctor Who's past and and mm. other things, but just to reading in general. And I think, honestly, everyone owes you a a huge oh, debt you. of Thank thanks. Um, no, I mean, uh, I I think if you can get a kid reading for pleasure, not because it's work, but actually reading for pleasure, mm. you know, You've got it's a look. great step forward. Yeah. You can start with me and work, you know, start yeah. with Dicks and work his way up to Dickens, <laughs> as it were, you know, but um, as long as you get them reading. One of the reasons I'd love them to do novelizations again is so that you could novelize uh, The Unquiet Dead, my first uh, story. Oh, I'd, I'd love to do it. It's a great show, that. Yes. Because then the first line could be, it was a graveyard in Cardiff, <laughs> <laughs> which would please me enormously. <laughs> On the outside, it looked like an ordinary, old-fashioned police box. was presented by Mark Gators, produced by Simon Hollis, and was a Brooklapping production for BBC Radio 4.